national water plan for Thank the future. Thank you, Senator Grogan. The time for this debate has expired. Move to question time, Senator Hume. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Before the election, the Minister for Employment said people will be seeing in their bank accounts what the change of government means. <laughs> Last night's budget confirms that inflation will be higher, electricity prices will be higher, gas prices will be higher, real wage growth will be lower, and under a conservative Order. analysis, the average Australian family will be at least $2,000 worse off by Christmas. Minister, is this Order. what Labor mean Order. when they say Australians will be seeing what a change of government means in their bank account? Order. Order. Before I call the minister, I'm going to warn the Senate. I do appreciate Order, Senator Ayres. I do appreciate that people are very keen to make a contribution about the budget for better or for worse, but I am going to ask people to do it respectfully and to do it quietly. I will not put up with a lot of interjections because I could barely hear the tail end of Senator Hume's question then, and we've just started. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank Senator Hume for the question. Well, I think Australians expect their government to deliver a responsible budget, That's right. an honest budget, yep. a budget that deals with the economic circumstances That's of the right. time, a budget that deals and delivers on the election uh, commitments and that deals and fixes the mess that we inherited from the former government. Exactly. The mess in skills, the mess in energy, the debt and the deficit that you inflation. left us. Rising inflation, rising interest rates, a crisis in the energy markets in this country, an energy increase that you hid before the election. Australians expect honest, responsible Order. budgeting, and that is what they got last night. That is what they got last night. Delivering on our election commitments, not adding to the inflation problem that we are currently dealing with, which I'm not sure any of those opposite actually acknowledge is happening, not contributing to inflation, delivering on our commitments and dealing with the waste and the rorts and the mess that was left to us by you when you were in government for a wasted decade. A wasted decade that we, in five months, have started taking action on. We're taking action in skills, in childcare, in gender equality, in infrastructure, in health, in aged care, in PPL. All of these areas that you couldn't have given a hoot about. That's what we're doing. We're fixing the problems that were left with us to us. We are delivering on our election commitments, and that is what the people of Australia expect. They also expect some honesty from their government about the true state of the finances of this country. Things, again, that you hear, the dodgy, dodgy budgeting that was done in deals with the National Party. We are fixing all of it up. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Hume, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Minister, at the budget lunch in the Great Hall today, the Treasurer was asked, should Australians still expect that $275 off their power bills, particularly off pre-election pre 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 prices? The Treasurer responded, the Treasurer Order. responded, Order. Go, the Treasurer responded, yes, yep, it's in the budget. Oh. Minister, where in the budget is that $275? Uh, thank you, Senator Hume. Your time has expired. I'm waiting, senators, I'm waiting for silence before I call the minister. I'm still waiting. Senator Birmingham. Minister Gallagher. The policy we took to the election in terms of powering Australia, which that which the modelling underpin, is in the budget. And perhaps you got, haven't got to that that book. Perhaps you haven't. Perhaps you haven't moved past the headlines. Perhaps you haven't looked. But I can tell you, not only are we delivering on the policies that we put in place uh, in the election, we have done more because we've inherited a crisis in the energy market, in gas 
and electricity, and we're fixing oh, that. Sorry, uh, Minister, resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And with all due respect to the minister, this is a point of order in relation to relevance. Uh, Senator Hume's question was very, very clear. It referred to a quote in relation to the $275 promise being in the budget. Which page is it in? I would thank ask you. that you direct the minister to the question. Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, I believe were you seeking a on the point, point of order? order uh, I understand the senator has now finished, uh, but I would say to you, um, President, that you have previous rule, have ruled, as have previous presidents, that you know, putting a lot of rhetoric and words into a point of order and repeating the question is not appropriate. I was pulled up many times, as you might recall. As you might recall. Senator Brockman is smiling at me. He's smiling at me because he remembers that I, he pulled me up. So I would ask Thank that you, you do the same Thank you, to Senator the deputy Wong. leader who continues to do that, continues to do that, Thank you, uh, rather Senator than Wong. ask her own Please questions. Please resume your seat. Uh, thank you. I do believe the minister is being relevant, Senator Cash, and I'll continue to um, listen carefully. Please uh, continue, President. And uh, the Powering Australia plan is. Um, Powering Australia. Well, we Senator know. Henderson. Look, we we know those opposite don't believe in the energy transformation that is currently happening around the world and for which you're going to put your head in the sand on. Order. But it is happening. It Senator, is happening. Please resume your seat. Thank you. Please continue, Minister Gallagher. So, I mean, this is partly why you got booted out, because you don't believe in climate change, right? Because you don't believe in it. You don't believe in the transformation. The Powering Australia plan is in the budget. I'm happy to go through the separate measures that are in, included you, in that. The time has expired. Uh, Senator Hume, second sir. Thank you, Madam President. At the government's Jobs and Skills Summit, the Treasurer said our goals are just as clear. An economy where every Australian who wants a good, secure, well-paid job can find one. But this budget confirms that 144,000 Australians will lose their jobs and that wages will be lower for longer. So is the budget correct? Has the Treasurer broken his promise to the Australian people, just uh, like the Senator Minister for White. Energy, just like the Minister for Employment and just like the Prime Minister? Uh, thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, uh, well, on wages, the policy that you oversaw, which is keeping wages down as a deliberate design feature of your economic architecture, is gone. And if you look in the budget, you will see that wages um, Minister are Gallagher, increased. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. Um, Madam President, just to remind the minister to address her comments through the what chair. Is it that Thank you're you. you seeking, Senator Henderson? What were you? Order. Order. Uh, Senator Watt. Senator Henderson, I can only assume you were seeking a point of order. You need to stand and say point of order. But would you like me to do it again? Thank um, you. No, thank you. I don't want you to do it again. Thank you. Resume your seat. Um, the minister is being relevant, and I'll continue to listen closely. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. We are a government that wants to see wages move. I don't know if those opposite have noticed, but we are dealing with a tiny bit of an inflation challenge at the moment. There is, there is an issue here, which, which, it, which the government is responsibly uh, responding to, and that is impacting on wages. Now, we have supported. The minimum wage case. We are backing in a pay rise for aged care workers. We have in this budget indexed community organisations so that they too can get a pay rise, something that this, you guys, when you were in government, never did. We are determined to get wages moving. We are determined to get wages moving and to ensure that nobody is left behind. But these are challenging economic circumstances, and we will continue you, to work in the interest of Australian expired. people. Order. Uh, Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Can the Minister update the Senate on the government's budget and, in particular, how it is delivering cost of living relief for Australians? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank Senator Smith uh, for the question. Last night, the Treasurer delivered a responsible budget that is right for the times and readies us for the future. The budget confronts challenges that have been ignored for too long, 
and seizes the opportunities that won't wait any longer. It delivers on our commitments that the Australian people endorsed at the last election, affirming their faith in a new government. Yeah, yeah. Australians know a complex combination of challenges at home and abroad is pushing up the cost of living. They know the government can't make inflation disappear overnight. But our budget delivers on cost of living relief that is responsible, reasonable and targeted, and which delivers a long-term economic dividend. Our five-point plan for cost of living relief includes delivering cheaper childcare for 1.26 million families, with 96 per cent of families with children in care better off and no family worse off, expanding paid parental leave to 26 weeks for working parents, the biggest reform President, since Labor introduced it in 2011, making housing more affordable and helping more Australians to buy a home with 30,000 affordable and social homes delivered via the Housing Australia Future Fund returns and an additional 20,000 affordable homes delivered under the National Housing Accord, cutting the cost of medicines on the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, saving around 1.6 million Australians more than $190 in out-of-pocket costs each year supporting wage increases for our lowest paid workers, boosting job security and employee entitlements and getting wages moving again. I know it hurts your ears, but getting wages moving again. The $7.5 billion package helps put some money back into people's pockets, boosts productivity and grows the economy, but it's carefully targeted and carefully careful for the times so that it avoids you, placing Minister, additional pressure Senator on Mariel inflation. Smith, first supplementary. Can the minister provide further detail on how the government's budget is building a stronger, more resilient and more modern economy? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. Thank Senator Smith for the supplementary. Under the former government, our economy wasn't delivering for Australians like it needed to. The Jobs and Skills Summit brought Australians together to address the challenges and opportunities facing the labour market and the economy and help reverse the trends we've been seeing after a decade of wasted opportunity. Our budget delivers quality investments in the capacity of the Australian economy, capabilities of the Australian people, including fee-free fee -free TAFE and more university places, delivering our Powering Australia plan building a future with cleaner and cheaper energy. Understand that? That's what we need to do. A future made in Australia, Senator McGrath. investing in priority industries to grow our industrial base, diversify our economy and boost and support regional development and small business. We're also building disaster resilience and preparedness and investing in a value for money pipeline of national nation building investments through our infrastructure program. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith, uh, second supplementary. Can the minister provide further detail on how the government is repairing the budget to pay for what is important? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister. Thank you, Senator Smith. And yes, I can. Our budget begins the hard task of budget repair, fixing the budget. Let's just remember what um, we minister inherited. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. I'm going to wait for quiet until I ask the minister to continue her answer. Minister, Minister Gallagher. <laughs> Thank you, President. So we're repairing the budget that was left in, uh, with deficits, as far as I could see, debt increasing. Remember that? Doubled the debt before the pandemic. We are the first government in a long time to take the issue of budget repair seriously. We have found $22 billion in savings and redirected spending. We're still managing against Senator that Hugh, backdrop to invest in hospitals, in aged care, in child care, to support our, our uh, progress Henderson. towards gender equality, investing more in the NDIS and deepening relations in the Pacific and making sure that the uh, equipping defence to respond to some of the challenges that they are facing. We are managing to do all of this while finding $22 billion in savings to start to repair the budget that you Thank left you, in tatters. Your time has expired. Uh, when you're finished, Senator Hume uh, and Senator Henderson, you've got a member of your own side on her feet. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, President. And my question is also to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. I refer the minister to her answer to Senator Hume's question, where in responding to the Treasurer's statement that Labor's promised $275 
cut to power bills is in the budget. The minister said that the Treasurer was referring to the Powering Australia measures. Will these measures reduce power bills by $275, as Labor promised? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. Well, a couple of things to kick off with there. One, renewable energy is the cheapest form of energy. That is number one. Number two, there's a war in Europe, right? Right? And number three, we're fixing uh, order, a decade uh, minister, of— please resume your seat. Order. Order, Senator Wong. When there's quiet, I'll ask the minister to continue. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Our Powering Australia policy, which was modelled before the election— Senator Wong and Senator Cash. Please continue. Thank you. Our policy, which was modelled before the election, clearly outlined the policies that we need to implement in order to put downward pressure on household and business energy bills, and that is what we are doing. Well, if I can respond to the interjection, what about the little sneaky 20 per cent increase that you guys hid before the election? Remember that? Remember that? The Treasurer. Oh, let's take this rather unusual step of not um, allowing that minister, to happen. Minister, please resume your seat. Order. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. The 20 per cent increase that was known to the former government before the election. Let's put that out. Then you hit it. And you hit it because you were dishonest. Because that Order. is part another reason why you were kicked out of office. Because people didn't Senator trust McGrath. you and they didn't think you were doing the right thing. So let's just um, Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. President, on a point of order, I would again ask you to direct the minister to make a comment through the chair saying people don't trust you uh, is very derogatory of you, Madam President. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. The, the minister is uh, largely addressing the chair. Uh, order, Minister. Thank you. So we are implementing our Powering Australia plan, and you can see it through the budget. I'm happy to go through measures of it. We've got our rewiring the nation. Remember that, because the energy grid isn't fit for purpose. I wonder why. Ten years of a government that didn't do anything, that didn't do its job. So yes, that's in the budget. We've got money for dispatchable storage technology. We've got money for community um, batteries. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator McGrath, you seem to be desperate to ask questions. But you don't ask them order. You don't ask them by constantly interjecting across the chamber. Please continue, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I will. We've got community batteries for household solars. We've got community um, solar Minister banks. Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, and uh, President. The point of order is in relation to relevance. With all due respect, again to the minister. Uh, you are answering a lot of questions, what's potentially, your point of order? yes, but not the question well, sorry, that the I asked order? in relation to will the Powering Australia measures reduce electricity prices by $275 as uh, promised? Senator Cash, that was Senator the Cash, question. I, uh, you've been in the chamber all of this week, and almost every day I've ask people when they're making a point of order to simply state the point of order. You've repeated the question. Um, you just need to stand and make a short statement. If it's about relevance, then make that statement. I do believe that the minister is canvassing a whole range of options around power bills, such as you, was in the preamble to your question. And I'll listen to the last 18 sec uh, seconds of the minister's answer. And if she's not being relevant, I will direct her to your question. Minister. Thank you, President. Well, I was asked about the Powering Australia plan, which is exactly what I'm going to in my answer. So we've got the community solar banks, we've got energy efficiency grants, which my colleague uh, Senator McAllister has, been, has been, got carriage of. We've got other programs in the, uh, in the budget which delivers on the Powering Australia plan, and we know that delivering that Thank will you, Minister, lower your time power has prices. Expired. Uh, Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you. And despite Labor telling Australians that if you were elected, you would reduce their power prices by $275 a year, and despite the Treasurer's misleading statement 
at the luncheon today, your own budget papers confirm your broken promise. What do you therefore say to Australians who won't be able to afford to keep the lights on and will suffer through the sweltering heat this summer? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. What I say to, to Australians. Order. Order. What I say to Australians who are rightly concerned about increasing power prices, who absolutely is that they have a government that is 100 per cent focused on responding to this in every way we can, who will work with states and territories who also have responsibilities here to do what we can. No, well, Order. sorry, President, I know I shouldn't respond to interjections, but I know working with states and territories is a foreign concept to those when they were in government for 10 years. That was part of the problem. So, yes. Please we resume your seat, Minister. Senator McAllister. Order across the chamber. Minister, please continue. A foreign concept where the Federation actually works together in the interests of the Australian people. I know that is foreign. I know that is foreign, but that is what we will do. We are committed to it. From the highest levels of government, we will be dealing with this, and that is what we say to the Australian people about it. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Cash, second Thank you. supplementary. Prior to the election, Mr Albanese promised Australians that, if elected, his government would help Australians deal with the cost of living pressures. As Senator Hume has mentioned, though, your budget last night confirms that by Christmas the average Australian family will be at least $2,000 worse off. Is a $2,000 hit to the bank accounts of all Australian families Mr Albanese's way of helping with the cost of living. Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. There is a seven and a half billion dollar cost of living package in this budget, but we also accept that these are really, really difficult circumstances. Really, really difficult circumstances for households, for families, and for businesses. We have, and we inherited, a high inflation environment. We've got in high inflation. Well, you can pretend that the inflation problem isn't there, Senator Cash, but we don't have the luxury of doing that. We have to deal with the inflation challenge. We can't add. We can't add to inflation, and that's why we are, we are working alongside. We don't want to work, make the Reserve Bank's job any harder. We don't want to fuel inflation. We know that inflation hits households on low income or fixed incomes harder than anyone. So we need to make sure that what we do is responsible, aligns with monetary policy, delivers on our commitments and doesn't add to inflation in the short term. That is what this government will deliver and that is frankly you, what Minister. we must the deliver. The time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, President. My question is to Minister Wong, representing the Minister for Climate Change. The Australian people voted for an end to public handouts to the coal and gas industry. But Labor's very first budget is adding $1.9 billion of new funding on top of keeping the $40 billion of existing subsidies for coal, oil and gas. Why are you too poor to give cost of living relief to families, but not too poor to give away $42 billion of subsidies to the fossil fuel sector and $254 billion in stage three tax cuts to the rich? Thank you, uh, Senator Waters. Minister Wong. Uh, well, President, I, I'm going to, I think the Order. first part of the question, the second part was a general political um, point. First part of the question, goes to uh, a matter not in the portfolio I'm representing, I believe goes to the Minister for Resources. So I'd ask you to direct subsequently a question to uh, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Senator Wong. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Wow, that's pretty unprecedented. You don't want to talk about fossil fuel subsidies. Right on. Well, you Order. shouldn't have put them in your budget then if Senator you didn't want Water. to talk about them. Senator Waters, Order. Order. Senator McGrath. Order. I would ask all senators in this place, Senator Cash, to listen respectfully to the question that Senator Waters wishes to make. 
I want to see silence on all parts of the chamber. Senator Waters, please continue. Thanks, President. If anyone in the government would like to answer this, they're welcome to. Minister Bowen was reported in The Guardian Senator saying there would be no new public funding for coal and gas. Why is your first budget giving billions to frack for gas in the carbon bomb that is the Beedaloo Basin and to fund an export terminal in Darwin Harbour for that gas, all without First Nations consent? Uh, Senator Birmingham. Point, point of order, President. Uh, pre President, uh, point of order. I just Senator want to make clear Wong, to the chamber: the seat. opposition will give Senator leave Wong. for any government minister who ah. wants to answer a question to do Senator, so. Senator Birmingham, that's not a political point. They're not a point of order. Order. Uh, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. I assume I'm calling Senator Wong to answer the first supplementary, or am I calling? Uh, I'm, interest, I'm interested in the coalition's newfound uh, uh, cooperation with the Greens, and I invite Senator Birmingham to go and explain that to Mr. Dutton in the upper pla other place. Senator, uh, Senator uh, Waters, we are very pleased to answer questions, and I have answered multiple questions in this chamber that have been directed to the wrong minister. You say it is unprecedented. All we are asking you to do is what question time is pe people are required to do in question time, which is to address the question to the correct minister and the portfolio. If you wish for assistance in that, Order. we can provide you Senator with that. Senator Scar. But a shame that the Westminster tradition ought be upheld, Senator Thorpe. Perhaps you're not the person to be interjecting on that this week. <laughs> So, uh, if you wish to seek leave, uh, I'm happy for the matter to be redirected, if that's what you want, to Senator Farrell for his, in his portfolio. But the first question you asked was in relation to the resources portfolio. It is not unreasonable for us to indicate to you that the relevant minister is not the minister to whom you address the question. If you wish to do it, uh, I'm happy your time to, to see. I'm happy. Senator Wong. I... Senator Wong, please resume your seat. I... Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Waters, second supplementary. Yes, thank you, President. I did, in fact, invite any minister who wished to speak and about fossil fuel subsidies Senator to Waters, answer that, the question. That is so not I'm actually appropriate. genuinely need... unclear on what I meant to do uh, here. Senator, Senator Waters, order, order, order. I would remind the opposition in this place, Senator Henderson that you get most of the questions. It is not unreasonable for Senator Waters to expect silence when she stands to ask her question. Senator Waters, you need to direct your question to a minister. Well, I don't care who answers it. I just want an answer. Minister Wong, Minister Farrell, whoever. I find it ridiculous that the climate change minister can't answer a question about fossil fuel subsidies. But my final question goes to a windfall profits tax on coal and gas. Why aren't you proposing that, given that the whole crossbench supports it, rather than giving them handouts? Uh, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Waters, I can only assume I'm to call Senator Wong. Uh, I'm not sure which question. Order. Order. I'm not sure which question uh, Senator Waters is referring to. It sounded more like a speech, if I may say, than a question. But uh, oh, now, now Senator the cash is backing you. That's interesting. Um, oh, well, I have I have said to you, Senator Waters, on your first question, which goes to. Uh, taxation me measures and other measures in the resources portfolio, if you seek leave that they be directed to the, separate, uh, the correct minister, I would grant, uh, the Labor Party will grant leave. You've sought not to take that. You've now asked a second question about future tax policy, which I'm happy to respond to and, and say to you that the government's tax measures are as those set out in the budget. Uh, Senator Green. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Senator Waters, I didn't see you. Resume your seat, Senator Green. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks, President. With your indulgence, I seek leave for all parts of my question to be taken on notice by whomever wishes to respond to me, please. Sure. Thank you. Senator Waters, they, uh, Senator Wong has indicated they'll be taken on notice. Uh, Senator Green. 
Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, Senator Watt. How does the budget invest in infrastructure, including in our regions, to deliver the best outcome for the Australian people now and into the future? Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for quiet. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Green. I was very much hoping that I would be asked a question about our infrastructure budget and how it benefits regional Australia. And funnily enough, you asked the question. Good infrastructure is critical to building the nation and the regions we all want and deserve, creating jobs and building better connections within and between communities. And that's why I'm pleased to say that last night's budget delivered a $123 billion infrastructure pipeline over the next 10 years. That is a bigger pipeline than the Liberals and Nationals ever promised, Senator even McGrath. after we stripped out the waste and the rorts and the smoke and the mirrors of projects that were announced and never delivered. It's an infrastructure pipeline that will deliver in every corner of Australia, in Queensland, Senator Gr Green's home state. Uh, over Watt. half a billion dollars will be Senator provided. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Mackenzie, seriously. Senator Mackenzie, I've called you to order. That's what I expect to happen. It's not a contest between you and me. I'm the president. I've asked you to be quiet. I've constantly had to draw your side of the parliament to order. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. As I was saying, in Queensland, our budget contains over half a billion dollars for the Bruce Highway through Brisbane's outer north and between Gladstone and Rocky, as well as locking in over a billion dollars for the Coomera Connector Stage 1 on the Gold Coast. In Senator far north McGrath. Queensland, where Senator Green lives, the Albanese government is investing over $200 million on the Coranda Range Road upgrade between Smithfield and Coranda. In New South Wales, our budget includes a new $300 million uh, commitment for the Western Sydney Roads package, upgrades to Brindabella and Mandalong Roads, and even $38.6 million for Coulson's Creek Road in the Hunter, a project that the member for New England claimed to have secured funding for when he had done no such thing. I could go on through every state. In Victoria, there's the Suburban Rail Group as well as money for the Gippsland Rail Line upgrade. Tasmanians will get safer, faster travel through upgrades to the Bass Highway, Tasman Highway, East and West Tamar Highways, and unlike the last government, we'll actually deliver Senator the Bridgewater McGrath. Bridge. In South Australia, we've maintained almost $5 billion for the North-South Corridor, many other commitments as well, Western Australia money for the Bunbury Outer Ring Road, uh, as well as the Metronet, and of course, the Northern Territory and the ACT are getting great infrastructure investment as well. You, we Senator are delivering. Your you just made expired. it up. Senator Green, uh, wait for the call. Senator Green, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, how does the budget end oh, the waste sorry. and rorts and deliver an infrastructure pipeline that Australians can trust? Uh, before I call the minister, thank you. I have Senator Wong on her feet. Senator Wong. Uh, I couldn't hear the second half of the question. I'd ask that the, the senator be allowed to permit sure. to repeat it, Thank please. Thank you, uh, Senator Green. If you would um, repeat the second half of your question, I did not hear it either. Thank you. <laughs> Just the second half. It's a, it's a very short question. Uh, how does the budget end the waste and rorts and deliver an infrastructure pipeline that Australians can trust? Um, before I call the minister, I'm going to remind senators. Order, Senator Canavan. Seriously, Senator Watt has a loud voice, and I, yet I can hear a range of interjections above his microphone voice. Order, order. It is not your point to argue back, Senator Mackenzie. Um, Minister. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Green. The very best thing about last night's infrastructure budget is that, is that it is full of projects that Australians can actually believe in. The years of rorts, waste and Barnaby and Bridget funny money and colour-coded spreadsheets are over. Remember the rorting of regional funds? Remember the regional funds that were rewarded to provide swimming pools in North Sydney? Very regional over there in Lavender Bay and Kirribilli, isn't it? Yes, very regional. Remember the $30 million commuter car park that the coalition announced, even though there was nowhere to build it? Or the absolute debacle of the Leppington Triangle, 10 times the market value? What a bargain! 
and that's before we get to the inland rail. All those coal-fired power stations Canavan used to promote and never actually got to build. They promised 100 dams and built two. They spent 10 years lying to the Australian public with funny money and colour-coded spreadsheets, and it has stopped. Finally, Australians have a, a government they can believe in that will actually Senator deliver McKenzie. and stop the rorts and stop the waste. Thank you, Senator Watt. I'm waiting again. Senator McKenzie Sen and Senator Watt. And Senator Watt, I remind you when you are referring to people in this place and the other place to use their correct titles. Uh, Senator Green. Second sub uh, se Senator. You've, the time's expired. I'm going to Senator Green for her second supplementary. <laughs> Thank you, right? President. Uh, Minister, how has eliminating the waste and rorts in the infrastructure budget enabled new investment in infrastructure and our regions? Thank you, Senator Green. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Green. We make absolutely no apologies for getting rid of the false promises and funny money that littered year after year of Liberal and National Party budgets. The Australian people have had a gutful of colour-coded spreadsheets, bad value for money and the shambles that this lot employed when it came to infrastructure. I've already given examples, but the list goes on. To end the waste and rorts, we are closing down the egregious urban congestion fund, rorted beyond belief by the former government, and we're cancelling a number of their most egregious commuter car park projects as well. The Liberals and Nationals wanted to build car parks on land allocated to affordable housing or at train stations that were being closed down. We want to invest in infrastructure that actually matters. I've got news for the National Party and the Liberal Party. That big slushy machine that you ran for years, that is closed. We are going to be delivering real infrastructure that delivers real economic benefits to our regions and our cities, employs real jobs, and you know what? We'll actually deliver. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Roberts. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Watt. The contract the European Health Agency signed with Pfizer for the purchase of COVID vaccine is now in the public domain. Although its bona fide has not been officially recognised, that contract indicates that, yes, Pfizer was given a financial indemnity against damage claims resulting from harm their COVID vaccine caused. Minister, does our contract that the Morrison-Joyce government signed with Pfizer include a clause that indemnifies Pfizer from any claim for damages resulting from harm to Australians injected with Pfizer's community uh, substance? Um, Senator uh, Roberts, just before I go to that, I believe you directed the question to Senator Watt, but I'm advised that it should go to Senator Gallagher. Senator Gallagher? If she's, if she's representing the yes, Minister she for is. Health. Thank yep. you. Um, Minister Gallagher. Thank you, uh, President, and I thank uh, Senator Roberts for the question. Um, obviously, this predates um, this government, the arrangements that were entered into on. Um, just give me a chance, Jared. Jeez. Again, Jared. Um, I, I am getting to it. My understanding is there is an indemnity in place, but if I am wrong, I will come and ch uh, change the record. I understand it was put in place for a number of the new vaccines uh, because they were new uh, and so there were um, sort of particular COVID related uh, arrangements uh, put in place uh, to ensure that we could essentially uh, support the rollout of a widespread national vaccination program uh, which was so important to ensuring that we protected Australians from the worst of the COVID outbreaks that, and that was essentially a secret getting the vaccine program rolled out, protecting people um, in the fastest possible way was a key strategy of managing uh, the pandemic. If I have anything else to add to that, um, I will come back, and, and, and particularly if I have to correct the record. But I recall from my chair of the COVID committee um, arrangements that there were indemnity arrangements put in place for vaccine contracts. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator Roberts, first supplementary. The contract between the European Health Agency and Pfizer included a provision that product indemnity was voided should Pfizer have committed fraud, such as in their vaccine approval process. Minister, does our contract with Pfizer include a similar get out of jail free clause for Australian taxpayers that allows the indemnity to be removed in the case of Pfizer misconduct or for any other reason? If not, on what basis, Minister, was the decision taken to absolve Pfizer of responsibility for any harm their substance caused? 
Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I think it's probably best that I take that question on notice because it does. Uh, I wasn't a member of the government that entered into the arrangement. I'm not trying to um, not take responsibility, but I think it's probably best that I uh, get a, uh, an answer to you. Um, uh, following taking some advice about that. I know there were elements of the contract that weren't public, um, and I don't know if there are some um, commercial in confidence arrangements in place, uh, but I will seek to update uh, the Senate with what information I can find to, in an attempt to answer your question, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Minister. <coughs> Senator Roberts, second supplementary. Thank you. That would be appreciated, Minister. The TGA database <laughs> of adverse events notifications lists 136,000 adverse vaccine events the majority from Pfizer. Doctors have reported almost 1,000 deaths, thought to grossly underreport actual deaths, and the Australian Bureau of Statistics recently reported 15 deaths. <laughs> Apparently, Australian taxpayers will carry that entire liability. Minister, have you personally read the contract and will you release the Pfizer contract so that we can all see what the government agreed to? Thank you, Senator Roberts. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, my uh, my answer is probably uh, to this question is similar to um, my last question. I haven't uh, personally read the contract um, from with Pfizer, um, and I do understand that there might be elements of that that aren't in the public domain in commercial in, nor standard commercial and confidence arrangements. I do know that the TGA does report, as Senator. Um, uh, Roberts pointed out about adverse events, and I should say that um, you know there are a range of events within that. Just any reaction to the vaccine, including the most severe reactions. Um, but I would also say there's uh, been um, you know millions and millions of doses of, uh, of provided through the vaccination program to protect Australians uh, from COVID. So it has been overall a very, very successful uh, vaccination program in protecting Australians from the worst effect of, um, of COVID-19. If there is anything further I can provide uh, to the Senate, I will. Thank, Thank you. you, Minister. Senator MacDonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. The budget has forecast that gas prices are set to rise by 40 per cent over the next two years. How does cutting millions of dollars of support for developing gas supply including in the Cooper and Ada Vale basins, while also in increasing funding to activists who oppose the development of gas supplies, curb rising gas prices. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Thank you. So this is the Senate in action, uh, criticised for uh, investments in middle arm and then criticised uh, for other project uh, decisions. Um, this government does acknowledge that uh, the gas and other fossil fuels um, will continue to be required to support Australia's energy system. And I think that's important to, to say to the chamber. Uh, and I think you see, you see the results of that in the budget in terms of projects we support, but you also see that we do want to be part of the transformation and the move to a renewable energy future. And so you also see decisions like that in the budget. And that is what any responsible government should be doing at this point in time, making sensible investments where they stack up in relation to middle arm. It's investing in those, um, you know, the, the general use facilities that, that um, support that infrastructure, uh, but also making sensible investments in renewable energy. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that is the approach the government's taken. We do acknowledge that gas prices have increased and are going to continue to increase. The government has taken a number, has had a number of responses to that, led by um, Minister King, which has delivered um, successfully in the short term on the supply issues. But there is more work to be done um, through the heads of agreement and uh, looking at the codes of conduct uh, and looking at where we can um, ensure that people are able to afford their energy bills and businesses are able to continue to operate um, Minister in an environment Gallagher, like please resume your seat. Uh, Senator MacDonald. Point of order on relevance, please. Uh, the minister's being directly relevant, uh, Senator MacDonald. Um, Minister Gallagher, did you wish to continue? Senator MacDonald, um, first supplementary. The minister's completed her question. Uh, so it is clear that the government has no real plan to address rising gas and energy prices or supply. Considering South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales are all set to experience energy shortages over the next three years and gas makes up 22 per cent of Australia's energy consumption, why has the government cut support 
for developing gas supply in the Cooper and Adavale basins? Won't this slowing of new supplies drive energy bills up rather than to help bring them down by, say, $275? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we're trying to do a few things um, in this budget, and it's as I outlined in the first question, which is um, actually being an active participant in the transformation that's occurring in our energy system, um, dealing with the mess that we were left. We walked into government into a gas crisis. I mean, I know you try and rub that out, but essentially, I remember Minister Bowen and Minister King leaving the swearing-in ceremony to go and deal with what was happening in the gas markets. That is what was happening. Okay? So we have taken a number of steps to deal with that. In fact, the, the focus of the first tranche of work was over dealing with the supply shortages that were being identified through the work of the ACCC. So we have actually dealt with that. We are investing in projects where it makes sense. We're not just giving money for subsidies. We're in Middle Arm, for example, we're supporting common use infrastructure and we are supporting the shift to renewable energy at the same time. Thank you, our Minister. Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Minister, can you cite a budget measure that will specifically help to lower gas bills for Australian households and businesses? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, there was a range of um, uh, initiatives in the budget, including extra funding to the regulators to deal with the mess that we have inherited from you. So, uh, there, there is one. Well, you asked me the question. You said name one. There is funding for the regulators to make <laughs> sure we we are getting yeah Order. well exactly Order. well you might not find that information useful but the ACCC's report into the uh, supply shortage informs government decision making i would just wait until it's quiet again before i call the minister minister have you completed oh, do you wish to complete your answer or have you completed I've called um, you again because yeah. I sat you down. Yeah. Sorry, President. Well, I was asked to name one, and those opposite are laughing at it. But they are that that it's not a joke. It's not a joke because the regulators and the experts are the ones that identified the shortfall that you guys had your head in a sand over and we dealt with. So don't say it's a joke. Running out of gas is pretty serious. Running out of gas is pretty serious, and that's what you Senator left, McGrath. and we've fixed Senator it. McGrath. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Um, Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and Women. Minister, a budget sets out the values of a government. With every dollar it spends, it sends up a flare about what it stands for. Last night's budget was a chance to help Australians deal with very real cost of living pressures by redirecting stage three tax cuts. These cuts, a quarter of a trillion dollars, flow to very wealthy Australians, mostly men, mostly older people. That will widen income and gender inequality instead of helping those most in need. Why has your government stuck with a $9,000 annual tax cut for the wealthy, striking a real blow against Australia's progressive income tax system, while leaving low-income families struggling to pay for food, power and rent? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. The government hasn't changed its position on stage three. Uh, our focus in this budget as we had said from the outset, was to deliver on our election commitments uh, to sensibly uh, take pressure off cost of living uh, for uh, Australians and businesses where we could do so without impacting on inflation and dealing with the waste and rorts of the previous government. They were the, the objectives of the October budget. The tax, uh, the tax um, cuts that come in don't come in for another two years. Uh, I think what this budget does uh, and there is substantial investment, uh, both in, on the payment side—$33 billion increase um, in the indexation arrangements for payments to help deal with um, some of the cost of living pressures that fixed and low-income households are under. There's also half a billion dollars going to the community sector to deal with their indexation challenge that's been ignored for the last 10 years. Uh, to deal with some of the cost of living pre um, you know, um, pressures that those organisations are under. And there's the first step in a pretty serious package for women um, as well. So I don't think it's an either or. Um, what this budget does is it sets out the challenges ahead. The Treasurer and I have made no secret about the spending pressures that are coming our way. 
Um, and you can see that if you look at the medium term projections and acknowledge that those five big spending programs uh, are not going to change. We're going to see defence, aged care, hospitals, NDIS and the cost of servicing a trillion dollars of debt are going to continue to place pressure on the budget. And we want a pretty upfront discussion about how we meet well, how we value those services, how we provide those services and how we meet the costs of them into the future. And that's a part of I think this is the first step in that discussion, and I think the Australian people are up for that discussion and they've got a responsible government that's prepared to have it with them. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, in my state, South Australia, I recently met with a group of people living on JobSeeker. They often cannot afford food or medicine. Their kids don't make it to school excursions. Their teeth give them pain every day. They're living on a job seeker rate of $48 a day, well below the poverty line, yep. in one of the wealthiest countries on the planet. Why has your government refused to raise the poverty level of job seeker? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Gallagher. Um, well, there are, as I said, there is a significant increase in the job seeker uh, indexation arrangements. 33 $33 billion that will flow through to partly assist to partly assist with some of those increases in cost of living pressure. Um, but we don't pretend that there aren't uh, you know, continuing work to do in how we provide support and services to people on low income. Uh, but this budget is not the answer to everything. It is a, is a point in time. It is the first it is the first opportunity to do what we said we would do, which is have a budget which delivers on our election commitments, which, do, which um, makes sensible investments, which ease cost of living without impacting on the short-term inflation problem that we have in the economy, and deals with the waste and rorts that we inherited from those opposite. That was the objective of this budget. Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Minister, there is no economic evidence that giving tax cuts to wealthy men will boost their work rate or their productivity or make any difference to GDP. However, there is buckets of evidence that supporting working carers and women will do all of these things. Why have you backed in a tax measure that mostly benefits wealthy men while offering women no superannuation on their paid parental leave, no lifting of the rate of paid parental leave to their normal pay rate, Thank and making Senator them wait Pocock, four years to get to just 26 weeks? Uh, thank you. Um, well, the tax cuts that uh, the senator refers to are in the budget and the, uh, are factored into the budget, and the government hasn't changed its view on that. In terms of um, the other supports, this is an ongoing uh, piece of work before the government. I mean, we will every budget we have said we will look at what we can do to support people, particularly those who rely on government uh, to who rely on government support. We will assess that. You have seen that in this budget as the first step in a number of budgets where these issues will continue to be uh, looked at across the ERC table. In terms of the investments in women uh, or su services for women, support policies well, uh, for, to progress gender equality, I think compared to what we've had in the last few years, this women's budget statement is a serious start in terms of looking at the issues, providing some analysis and starting with the policies uh, that you, aim Minister. to fix Thank you, Minister. Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. Can the minister please inform the Senate how the Albanese government's social services commitments are supporting families and promoting the safety of women and gender equality? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President. And can I thank Senator Sheldon for his uh, very important question and his interest in this uh, important part of uh, the federal government's policy. And of course, the uh, Albanese government is putting families and gender equality at the centre of policy making. This is not a new commitment. It's been at the centre of our decision making processes. And we saw last night through the uh, Treasurer's uh, budget speech. Um, that uh, we've dealt with this uh, issue. In the lead up to the 2022-2023 uh, budget, we announced that uh, we uh, deliver the biggest boost 
to Australia's paid parental leave since it was created, giving every family with a new baby uh, more choice, greater se security and better support. The extension of paid parental leave is the first time the scheme has been modernised since the Labor government introduced the scheme in 2011. And it's the, corner, it's the cornerstone of our commitment to address gender equality issues in this country. We're also deeply committed to ending violence against women and children in Australia, and we're taking action. To this end, the, the very fine Minister for Social Services uh, released the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022-2032. We've also introduced legislation for 10 days paid family leave and domestic violence leave per year to ensure that uh, no one should have to choose between a job and seeking uh, support to deal with uh, domestic uh, violence. Uh, we are conducting an open, competitive process to appoint a domestic family and uh, sexual violence commissioner to act as an advocate for, uh, for victims uh, and uh, survivors to oversee the implementation of the national plan, including uh, the monitoring and evaluation. In addition, uh, the budget released uh, last night, we confirm our $1.7 billion Thank you, commitment Senator Farrell, to— Your time has expired. Senator Sheldon, second, first supplementary. Uh, can the minister further please inform the Senate how the national plan to end violence against women and children in 2022-2032, launched last week, will be implemented? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister. Thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Sheldon for his uh, supplementary question. And on the uh, 17th of October uh, 2022, uh, that very fine minister, Minister Rishworth, <coughs> launched the National Plan to End Violence Against Women and Children 2022-2032, along with my colleague in the Senate, uh, the Minister for Women, the very fine Senator Gallagher and state and territory ministers for women's uh, safety. In the plan, the government has set uh, ourselves an ambitious goal to end violence against women and children in one generation. To support the plan, the Albanese government has committed $1.7 billion for women's safety initiatives. The plan includes example indicators for success that can track our progress in implementing this national plan. The National Plan will also support uh, by an outcomes framework that will increase our ability to track, monitor and report change over the life of the uh, National Plan. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Can the minister please inform the Senate how the Albanese government is supporting families and gender equality by boosting paid parental leave? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And thank, uh, uh, Senator Sheldon for his uh, second supplementary question. Increasing uh, paid parental leave was one of the uh, most frequent proposals raised at the successful Jobs and Skills Summit in September. The Albanese government has listened, has continued to consult and will now act to deliver the biggest expansion of uh, the paid parental leave scheme since it was first introduced by Labor in 2011. The budget invests $531.6 million over four years and $619.3 million annually after that to progressively uh, scale up the scheme to 26 weeks or six months by 2026. Our changes will benefit more than 180,000 families nationally. We know that many dads want to take more time off following the birth or adoption of a child. We see that increasing uh, take up a parental leave you, by Minister, dads your in the time has expired. Right. Senator Rustin. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, President. Um, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Gallagher. Uh, can the Minister please advise whether the government believes that demand for state and territory hospital services will increase or decrease over the next four years? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister. Thank you. Um, Really? I think I know where this might be going. Uh, we expect that hospital activity um, and demand for hospital activity uh, will increase. There has been a decrease in activity because of the pandemic, um, and that, that has been reflected in adjustments through the activity-based funding arrangement. But we are expecting that demand for hospital uh, services will continue to grow uh, as we normalise back into a post-COVID world. I would also say that those adjustments in the budget don't take into account the uh, COVID extra funding that went through the COVID payments. 
Thank you, Minister. Senator Rustin, first supplementary. Um, thank you very much, um, Madam uh, President. Um, could the minister please explain uh, why, um, if the, she believes and states the government believes that there will be an increase in demand for hospital services, uh, that there has been a $2.4 billion cut to hospital services Ooh. that are being provided to the uh -oh. states and territories over the next uh -oh. four years, which uh, they say is as a, res a reflection of the reduction in the volume of hospital services that are demanded. Ooh. Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. I, I would have thought, considering that um, you've, you've recently been in government, that you would understand how uh, the funding flows through uh, in these. They are largely parameter adjustments that are based on the activity they, they were on the activity um, that was uh, advised through the activity based funding well that's the reality that that is the system that you have order, operated on order. no forecast activity and activity through the pandemic based on the data that the states and territories provide to the commonwealth uh, is reconciled through the budget process. It doesn't take into account the extra funding that has and will continue to be provided through the special payments under the COVID arrangements. And as people would know, through the very successful National Cabinet, we continue to work with the states and territories over pressures more broadly in the health system, including a broken primary thank care you, system, Minister, which you guys time oversaw. Has expired. Senator Rustin, second, supp second supplementary. Um, thank you very much, um, President. Uh, well, in confirming that there is a $2.4 billion cut to hospital funding, can the minister please explain why the government has decided that Victoria is to pay $2 billion of that $2.4 billion cut to hospital funding? Thank you, Senator Rustin. Minister Gallagher. I'm not sure I understand um, what, what two things you're linking there. Um, no, well, I'm happy, I'm happy to take it on notice and come back to you, um, but there is an adjustment through forecast activity reconciled based on the, the work the hospitals have done. And the reality is, during the COVID-19 pandemic, they did less of their activity, less of their normal activity that gets funded through this mechanism. That has been reconciled. There, will, uh, there are, is additional funding going into health, I think in the order of $6 billion. Uh, so we continue to work with the states and territories. They've got a government that wants to talk to them, that wants to talk to them about how hospitals work, how the primary health care system works with that and how aged care works with that. You've got to see it on the continuum and you'll see that in the budget. More funding for aged care, more funding for health and working with the states and territories on a national health system. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. President, I ask that further questions be placed on Senator notice. Birmingham. I'm on my feet Senator still. Birmingham. I'm still uh, on my feet. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I am, in relation to question time yesterday, can I indicate I undertook to provide further information in response to questions asked of me by Senators Cox and David Pocock in my capacities as Minister representing the Minister for the Environment and Water, Minister representing the Minister for Finance relating to CSIRO and security of payments, I have written to both senators to provide additional information and I table my letters for the information of all senators. Thank you, Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, President. Uh, President, uh, I rise with a point of order. Uh, consistent with Standing Order 191, uh, I invite Senator Gallagher to uh, provide an explanation to the Senate in relation to the answers she gave to Senators Hume and Cash. Senator Gallagher gallantly sought to explain the statement by the Treasurer that the $275 cut in power bills is in the budget. But despite Senator Gallagher's gallantry, Mr Chalmers has told the other place where he has confessed that he misheard the question. That he misheard the question. Would Senator Gallagher like to correct the record? Uh, I'm advised, Senator Birmingham, that the standing order doesn't operate in that way, so I'm not asking the minister to do anything. Uh, Senator Watt. Um, thanks, President. In question time yesterday, I took elements of a question asked by Senator Patterson uh, to me on notice. I've written to Senator Patterson to provide a complete answer, and I now table that answer for the information of the Senate. Thank you, Senator Watt. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. And I rise to take note 
of all the questions asked by coalition senators to the government. Well, it's only in Labor's illogical, bizarre world could we get a federal budget that's propped up by resources but which also cuts support to them while giving extra ammunition to the sort of lawfare that we're going to see from the EDO. The resources minister is telling industry and media one thing, saying we're encouraging more gas supply to come to market. She knows that that's what's going to reduce energy prices and provide uh, better gas prices to the domestic market, but her cabinet colleagues are giving a nod and a wink to the Greens and every other extreme Green movement. So the Environmental Defender's Office have received an extra $9.6 million to conduct lawfare against the very industry that is the only solution we have to provide affordable gas to both the domestic market for manufacturing uh, but also, also for our export market. And it is this year alone that the gas industry is expected to provide $13 billion in royalties, company taxes and PAYG payments from the incredibly well-paid jobs that there are in the gas industry. And it is extraordinary to me that when I go to towns like Gladstone, like Rockhampton, like Mount Isa in Townsville, when the journalists ask me, what do you think this budget means for our people, our workers? And I have to say, well, it's not much good news, I'm afraid, because in this budget we have seen massive cuts, massive cuts to incredibly important budget commitments that we had for the development of Northern Australia, whether it be the billions of dollars to water funding, to Hell's Gate Dam, to well, where is? I'll take that, Senator Canavan. Uh, I will have to provide a map similar to the one provided by. Uh, Senator Watt, when he was uh, before he was a minister, he would bring a map to Ararat, where he'd carefully coloured in Northern Australia. I think just to remind him of, of where it is, and using that map, he would be able to see that the water uh, investments, the road investments, the half a billion dollars that's been cut from the Northern Australia infrastructure facility, the cuts to the Northern Australia development grants, the cuts to roads and significant investments, that this makes this a Robin Hood budget in reverse. Because what it does is it steals jobs from the north, but I'm not sure where they're giving them to. It's the kind of worst kind of theft because nobody benefits and everybody loses. Because it is the royalties and the company taxes of gas, of coal, of critical minerals that have allowed this country to be the first world country that we have. We've continued to hear about this budget, the sort of labour lies, the unravelling of budget commitments that I'm seeing now uh, uh, people right across the Australian landscape are saying, well, we don't believe this budget. We don't rate it because you promised us, you promised us the Rockhampton Ring Road, the Prime Minister to be put out a media release, committing to it something that is now deleted. Okay. They committed to a $275 electricity uh, cost uh, reduction, but now all we're seeing is electricity prices skyrocket. We, can, we know that Australian households are going to be— it will cost them another $2,000 a year by this Christmas. That's the impact of this budget and this government that doesn't know how to manage money, doesn't know how to manage the budget. This is the biggest spending budget. Another $50 billion in receipts because of commodity prices, and yet what have they done with it? Well, they've spent the lot. They've spent the lot. So they have cut money to the places that make money, and they're pouring it into uh, the Premier of Victoria's re-election campaign, a circular rail project that is going to assist a couple of people where they need to hold government, but the places that mine the resources, that grow the agricultural products, that secure the nation's future for generations to come, cut, 
dead, gone, because that's what regional Australia means to Labor. Absolutely nothing. Senator Polly. The comments from the good senator in relation to our budget last night. This is from the co coalition opposition. When they were in government, they left Australia with a trillion dollar debt. That's what they did. Had 10 years in office, in office to deliver on energy prices, to actually deliver an energy policy. I think there was 22 different energy policies, but that's when they actually had policies, I might add, because now, according to their front bench, they don't have policies because they're in opposition. Can I just say, in terms of the, the budget that was delivered by Dr Chalmers yesterday, was a budget that is looking to change the way the federal government operates going forward. And that is a government that is run by adults, a government that is going to be open and transparent, a government that will deliver on its election commitments, and it will govern with integrity. That's the big change. When I had the good fortune to make all the calls I did this morning to businesses in Tasmania in terms of the investment that we've made through our budget to jobs, to giving opportunities to young Tasmanians, that has been so well received. The comment from one of the hydrogen companies was, it's not just a breath of fresh air to have this new government, but it goes beyond that. It goes about the way that we have operated since we're coming to government, the dignity, integrity that our leader, Anthony Albanese, has restored. People see this as a government that is prepared to work with the community, to work with the business community, to listen to the concerns of everyday Australians. That's the difference. This opposition wants to come in here and lecture us about election commitments. Come on. It's a joke. It's an absolute joke. Making announcements when you're in government does not equate to delivering on those commitments. You can re, as they did, re-announce re -announce various projects, but never delivered on them at all. And our very own member uh, of the opposition in the seat of Bass, where I live, is already trying to take credit for our budget trying to take credit for the things that we committed during the election campaign and we are delivering on. Now, when we talk about energy prices, Marinus, that has just been announced by this government, that was able to draw together a deal between, yes, the Victorian Labor government, but guess what? The Tasmanian Liberal government signed up with the federal government because they recognised there was such a change of attitude by the new government. Now, Turnbull government couldn't deliver mariners for Tasmania and for uh, the benefit of the entire country. Neither could Scott Morrison, after the years of his failings, was unable to deliver that. That's just one example. And we all know in this chamber, because I've spoken about it many, many times, renewable energy, the home for that is in fact in my home state of Tasmania. We know what, how important renewable energy is to this country. We know how important it is to our state, but we want to be a part of the future to deliver better outcomes when it comes to energy. We on this side of the chamber have always argued for more money, more resources and a commitment to climate change and addressing the needs of our country in relation to climate change. But we've delivered not only in terms of cheaper childcare, cheaper medicines, more paid parental leave, expanding that opportunity for both mums and dads, more affordable housing. We're actually restoring opportunities for people in regional Australia to go to TAFE. We want affordable housing for all Australians to be able to access. But what we have done and what we will continue to do, and that is to find the waste and mismanagement under the former Morrison government. But what we are doing is we're not using colour coding 
to allocate grants, they will be done on the needs basis, on business cases that are put to us that can demonstrate it's of benefit to that community. That's how a government should act, how we should govern, and that's how the Albanese Labor government will continue to govern this yeah, country. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Look, the people of Australia uh, are not all that concerned about the cross-chamber rhetoric that occurs in here. They're actually concerned about outcomes and the things that make a difference to their daily lives. And what they're seeing at the moment is headlines in the Adelaide Advertiser that was saying that power prices will increase by some 35 per cent uh, over next year. And now in the context of this budget period, uh, estimates that power prices will increase, in fact, by around 50 per cent. And for many families uh, in Australia, uh, that is crippling in terms of their ability to pay their power bills as well as the other aspects. So the question for them is, if this is the forecast, if this is happening, does the government have a plan to actually address the cost of living? Does the have government have a plan that will help families? And the minister, in answering the question that was put to her, talked about two things. One is the Powering Australia plan and the importance of the transition which is occurring, which the claim was that the government is all across and is following the transition that's occurring overseas. Well, I'd just like to point to overseas. Media reports this week in the UK are highlighting that more than half of UK adults are struggling to pay their power bills. And in Germany, some 4.2 million Germany, Germans are seeing electricity bills this year rise by over 63 per cent. Now, a lot of people have said, well, that's because of the war in Ukraine. But if you go back through the media from energy organisations in Germany, in fact, 2021, which was before the war in Ukraine, Germany saw the highest increase in their power costs on record. Now, Germany is often held up as a leader in this so-called transition of power. Yep. And if Powering Australia's plan is following Germany's lead, then it's not a good outlook for Australian people. South Australia is also sometimes held up as an example in terms of the penetration of variable renewable power. But when I speak to industry figures in South Australia, they highlight that one of the ways that the market operator manages power supply there is by managing demand. And the impact on industry in terms of forced shutdowns and lost productivity is measured in the tens of millions of dollars. And so there is a cost to that kind of management when you have a high penetration of variable renewable energies. And that cost to industry also means then there is a risk to jobs and job security, which is another factor that families are concerned about. The key point that Australians need to understand is that the science of climate change and the narrative and the rhetoric that has led to the commitment towards net zero and the Powering Australia plan is not actually representing the latest science. The OECD NEA report that was issued in April this year highlights and this is on the basis of work they've done with the International Energy Agency and others, so world leading engineers and economists, they have highlighted that wind and solar will not get us to net zero and will likely send us broke if we try. And as they work through all the system's costs, they say, come to the same conclusion that the IPCC and others have come to in all of the various scenarios that they model, that if the world wants to get to net zero, then as you start constraining emissions, you reach an inflection point where the cost of firming starts to go exponential. And that's what we're seeing in Europe. That's what we are starting to see in Australia. And the answer that the IPCC and the OECD and the IEA have come to is to point to the fact that as they look around the IEA member nations, the lowest cost of power considering not only levelised costs but systems cost is long-run nuclear power. And even for new build nuclear power, when you look at systems costs, it is the cheapest form of power. So there is an answer to getting to net zero while still having affordable, reliable power. 
But what it requires is for people to say, wind and solar have a place, but it is not the answer. There is a need for firming with a clean, reliable source, and the best engineering and economists in the world tell us that the cheapest and most affordable way to achieve that is to remove the prohibition we have on nuclear power and to invest in Australia's future. Senator Smith. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I'm pretty pleased, actually, with this taking note today. It's good to have an opportunity to come in and talk about the budget. I'm really proud to talk about our budget, and I'm really proud to be part of a government which, after only a few months, is already delivering for Australians. And it must really suck to be part of a government for a decade and deliver so little for Australians. Um, this is, this is a, a good position to be in. Look, Dr Chalmers handed down a budget last night which delivers responsible cost of living relief. Really important. Targeted investments to build a stronger and more resilient economy and budget repair. Budget repair which looks to address the waste and the rort of the last decade sensible, reasonable initiatives to get the budget under control, whilst also making sure that we provide that support for Australians in need. And let's talk about some of these cost of living measures. Uh, one of my favourite, favourite topics, let's talk about early learning. Because in this budget, we deliver on our commitment to make early learning more affordable for 1.26 million families. 1.26 million, Senator Chicone, I'll take that interjection gladly, 1.26 million Australian families. Really, really significant. Because you know what, Senator Hughes, you know what, it's really significant. The first five years, that's when 90 per cent of the brain development happens. If you don't form those connections early, if you don't form those connections early at early childhood education, children don't have the opportunity for those connections to form. The disadvantage, uh, sorry, Senator Hughes, yes. I think order, I have the call. Order. Through I think me, I have the Senator call. Smith. Sorry, through you, Chair. I think I have the call. Yes. Um, early childhood education, incredibly important. 1.26 million more. Uh, through you, Chair, I think I have the call. You do have the call. Do Order. I have the call, Senator Hughes? I have the call. Thanks. No, yeah, I'm not giving. I'm not giving Senator Hughes the call. I'm just calling her right. to order. Okay. Sh shall I continue? Please, please proceed. It's, it's my, my opportunity, not not Senator Hughes. I'll go, I'll go back. Early childhood education. 1.26 million more families will have access to more affordable early learning. A huge difference to children's lives, a huge difference to parents' lives. And of course, it's not just about those critical brain connections, which will happen because more kids get to go to an early learning setting. It's also about ensuring that more Australian families can get back to work, and particularly for women who we know shoulder the burden of care far more disproportionately than their partners. It's about getting back to work. Really significant. When we come to health, I know we had some questions on health today. Well, we're slashing the PPS maximum general co-payment to $30 a script. Again, after a decade of failure on health care, of undermining Medicare, of undermining our public health care system, Labor is putting money behind our commitment to bring back Medicare to the prominence and the significance it deserves. A fund fundamental feature of our society is being able to access affordable, health care, free health care indeed, when you need that assistance. It's been undermined by those opposite for a decade. We're making serious investments in our public health care system, investments I am deeply proud of. We've got more, 480,000 fee-free TAFE places, 20,000 university places for disadvantaged Australians. And yes, our Powering Australia plan, investing in cheaper, cleaner energy after a decade of no policy from those opposite. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. Sorry, 20 policies, I think. Was it 20? Was it 20? None? I can't remember. I can't remember. Definitely no strategic policy direction, possibly 20 policies which never managed to see the light of day. So serious investment and stability when it comes to climate policy, which we know is what the private sector has been calling out for for a decade to guide investment, to guide those decisions. Getting on with the job of that too. More affordable housing, of course. Very, very important. And our housing accord. Parental leave. Haven't got to that yet. Six months paid parental leave by 2026, another measure which will make a significant difference in terms of continuing that connection, continuing that connection between women and the workforce and encouraging 
partners, both partners, to take time in those critical six months to spend more time with their children. And these are just some of the big announcements, right? These are some of the big announcements when it comes to cost of living. In my home state of South Australia, we've made more commitments, which we have funded responsibly, but for really, really important things. Things like rebuilding the Yardo Health Clinic in Sejuna. Things like community batteries, another really significant project. This budget is taking responsible efforts to combat cost of living crisis before us. I'm really proud of it, proud to be a part of a government that works and turns up and does something. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, I mean, look, before I go into what I was originally going to speak about, I might point out to uh, Senator Smith that there's this, this budget is going to spend $4.5 billion in childcare to not create one new spot. Not one new spot. Now, one new spot of childcare not being created under $4.5 billion worth of spending. And for those of, you know, I understand Senator Smith's children are very young, so she may not have gone through this process. Mine are a bit older. There's not, nothing for me in the budget for older children, by the way. It's only good if your kids are really little uh, and you want to send them to childcare. But what's going to happen, and I think we're going to see this next year, is that families that are currently in childcare will probably go from three days to four because most childcare centres have their books closed. So there are no new spots being created, no new centres, nothing. $4.5 billion to allow families to go maybe from two days to four or three days to four. And it'll be really interesting when we have a look at this in the next 12 or so months and say how many new childcare spots were created because it's a big fat zero. Four and a half billion dollars for the families already in childcare, not creating one more new spot. Nothing for the parents and the families that want to stay at home with their children. There's six extra weeks they've added to pay a parental leave scheme, six weeks. Nothing for those parents that want to stay at home with their children for those five years where those brains are so busy developing, as Senator Smith pointed out, it's only to go into those childcare centres. Perhaps that's where they think the indoctrination can start. But what we saw last night was a budget that offers nothing for families. It offers nothing towards the pressures of cost of living. And in fact, it gives each and every family a bill of $2,000 for Christmas. We warned you, it wasn't going to be easy under Albanese, and we're seeing that every day. Inflation. Inflation's up at 7.1 per cent now. 7.1 per cent. Not Hughes. a lot of wriggle room. You're going to, let me read your mind. You're going to say that uh, the Prime Minister should be referred by his correct title. You're very good, uh, Deputy President. But yes, Senator Hughes, please order. refer to the <laughs> Prime Minister. I was going to remind you at the, at the, at the end of your contribution. Tony, for pointing that out. Uh, in fact, maybe you can point out to some of your colleagues that sit in front of you that they should Senator refer Hughes, to senators me, on this side me. of the chamber. Senator Hughes, through me, it's not a debate. Restrain yourself. It would uh, be nice to see those standards applied across the board. Senator Ciccone, but I know you are one of the few with integrity that sit on the other side. Now, what we do know is that 97 no. times we were all promised $275 off our power bill. But those of you who understand the energy market, we know that there's more renewables in the market than ever before. More renewables than ever before. But what's happening to the power bills? Up they go, and up they go, and up they go. We're going to see an increase to power bills. We're probably going to start to see calls again. Don't put your dishwasher on after 6 p.m. So for all those families that have now got the extra six weeks paid parental leave, don't go washing those nappies or the bibs after 6 p.m. because the power is not on because you can't afford the power. Can't afford the power for all that extra time at home developing those brains. And we know that those brains needing to be developed in our young children don't count if they're in the regions. Millions of dollars pulled from autism centres in regional New South, in regional Queensland, because families with autism don't count to those opposite. We only like to support the 32 per cent of Australians that actually voted for those opposite, punishing the other 68 per cent of Australians. But when we talk about renewable energy, and we talk about this cheaper energy that was planned and how it was all going to come through with an 82 per cent renewable target by 2030. 82 per cent. Now, what I thought I'd just point out, and even for those on my far left, because I don't think they understand what the actual requirements of this is, is 47 megawatt wind turbines, 40 of them, will need to be installed every month until 2030. So I'm just wondering, we're nearly at the end of October, where are the first 40 going? And where are the next 40 going in November? And the 40 after that in December. That's 120 needed by the end of the year. So I'm sure we'll get an update on where those 120 by the end of the year 
wind turbines are going to be installed to ensure that we can work towards Mr Bowen's target. Now, we also have, require, on top of that, more than 22,000 500 watt panels need to be installed every day. 22,000 every day. So where are they going? Over prime agricultural land? Who's going to make them? The Uyghurs in China? Because we don't seem to have a problem with slave labour when it comes to solar panels. We don't seem to have a problem of the landfill they create once they're finished with. We don't have any problems with that. So we need over 60 million solar panels by 2030. 60 million for those in the gallery. You need 60 million. Do you have a look where they're going to go? On your house, on your backyard, agricultural land, along with those wind, power, wind Thank you, uh, Senator turbines. Hughes. I put the question. Those the question. Uh, the, the question is that the motion moves to take note by Senator Macdonald. Those of the questions say aye. Against no. The ayes have it. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that the Senate take note of the answer given by Minister Gallagher to questions I asked this morning relating to the budget. Please uh, Senator, um, uh, budgets matter. They are a government's roadmap. With every budget dollar it allocates, a government signposts what it stands for and who it stands with. Budgets are about choices and choices about what you value. Choices about whether you want to make Australia fairer or look, look after the top end of town and leave others behind. In this budget, Labor have made a clear choice, their choice to retain stage three tax cuts, which will widen income, gender and intergenerational inequality, as have other choices they have made. They've retained negative gearing and capital gains tax benefits in relation to housing. They've refused to tax the windfall profits of the gas industry, unlike so many other countries have chosen to share those windfall gains with citizens. Indeed, the government's tax take from our existing oil and ta gas tax, the PRRT, actually falls by $450 million in this budget. What a failure of tax policy in a gas boom. These decisions all benefit corporations and the wealthy. They flow much more to men than to women, and they deliver much more for older Australians than younger. They widen inequality. And in giving away so much money to those who need it least, they narrow the opportunities to assist those who need it most. Appallingly, there was no help in this budget for those most in need in our society, those living on job seeker and youth allowance. That's a million Australians, amongst the 3.3 million who live in poverty. That's one in eight of us. Appallingly, it's one in six of our kids. Now, there's a statistic that should appear in any measure of well-being, the ratio of our kids who live in poverty. Labor chose in this budget not to increase JobSeeker. Two weeks ago, with Senator Janet Rice, I met with a group of people living on JobSeeker, brought together by South Australia's anti-poverty network. They were living lives of anxious juggling of last dollars and complex bus route navigation to get to food bank. They talked about the long queues at free food outlets in Adelaide. They talked about rent. They often cannot afford food or medicine. They bear the scars of poverty on their faces and on their bodies. They cannot afford the health care they need. Their kids don't make it to school excursions and their, feet, their teeth hurt every day. They're living on $48 a day, well below the poverty line in this very wealthy country. It's shameful. Last night's budget was a chance to help these and all Australians who are facing the very real cost of living pressures documented in the budget by redirecting the stage three tax cuts. These cuts, a quarter of a trillion dollars, flow to very wealthy Australians, mostly men, older people, instead of helping those who are most in need. The stage three tax cuts or a windfall tax on gas or cutting back on housing or super tax breaks there are a lot of unfair taxes to choose from, could have been used to help Australians. Australia does not have a tax revenue problem. It has a priorities problem. It has a courage problem. It has a leadership problem, and it has a failure to stand up to sectional interests problem, whether it's coal, oil and gas or other vested interests. The cost of living crisis is real. Rising rents, power, food all against the background of flatlining wages, falling growth and rising unemployment. 
Why has the Labor government stuck with a $9,000 annual tax cut for the very wealthy, striking a real blow against Australia's progressive income tax system, while leaving low-income families struggling to pay for food and power? There is no economic theory or evidence to support the idea that giving older, wealthy Australians a tax break, men mostly, will increase their work participation, increase productivity, increase GDP. None of that. There is, however, a powerful bucket load of evidence that says helping women get to and stay in work, helping working carers, has a massive effect on work participation, productivity and GDP and gender inequality. We can make a difference for our kids and for women. In this budget, we could have done many things and made a real difference for those at the bottom end of our society, helping them face living, cost of living pressures and narrowing inequality. Instead, Labor have backed in a tax measure that mostly benefits wealthy men while offering women no superannuation on their paid parental leave, no matching of, paid print of their normal pay rate in their paid leave, and making them wait four years to just get 26 weeks of paid parental leave, which is half the international standard. Thank we you. can do put, so much better. I'll put the question to the motion moved by Senator Pocock. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it.